the modulation, a uniquely powerful musical tool used to transport the listener from one key to another. Modulations have been in use for hundreds of years at this point, but the kind I want to talk about today is far more complex, unique, and intriguing than any other, to me at least. That kind of modulation is Jacob Collier's cross-terrain modulation. Most modulations you hear stick within a system of 12 fixed pitch classes. Most keys using seven of those. But the cross-terrain modulation does not limit itself to 12 divisions of the octave, but instead 1,200 divisions of the octave. But the pitches for each cross-terrain modulation are not picked at random out of those 1,200. They're very carefully selected so that the modulation is as least noticeable as possible to Western music listening ears. The way those pitches are selected is by using just intonation and frequency ratios. A brief explanation of just intonation and frequency ratios. When you hear any note that isn't a pure sine wave, which sounds like this, you're hearing upper harmonics that appear above the fundamental in exactly the same intervals every time. These intervals can be represented exactly by using simple ratios. For instance, the fifth harmonic, once collapsed down into one octave, sounds like a slightly flat major third. However, it doesn't exactly sound out of tune. It might to some who have only ever listened to 12 tone equal tempered music their entire lives, but mathematically, this is actually more in tune than what you're probably used to hearing. If you want a more in-depth video explanation of the harmonic series, Andrew Huang has a great introductory video essay on it, and I'll link that in the video description. Cross-terrain modulations take this idea of an interval that is slightly different from what you're used to hearing, but is also mathematically more in tune, and use it to slowly and subtly modulate from one key to another. Let's continue using that major third as an example. So here we are in C major in 12 tone equal temperament, meaning that the 12 pitches that divide the octave are completely evenly spaced. This is the system that has dominated Western music for the past couple centuries. To begin this simple CTM, let's retune that major third so that it is justly intonated in relation to the root of the chord and is a 5 to 4 ratio with it. We can also call this major third 14 cents flat from its 12 tet alternative. Cents, by the way, divide each of the 12 equally spaced notes into a hundred smaller divisions, which is where I came up with the 1200 divisions of the octave from earlier. That 5 to 4 ratio turns out to be almost exactly 14 cents flat from the 12 tet major third. Now that our major third is 14 cents flat, let's remove the other notes and keep that one sustained. Then, let's build another major chord, making that 14 cents flat note the root. Instead of using a 12 tet major third, let's use another justly tuned major third, which is now a total of 28 cents flat from a 12 tet minor sixth above our original C root. But because we no longer hear that C, it doesn't sound 28 cents flat, it only sounds 14 cents flat, which sounds more in tune compared to our new root, to some people and is mathematically more in tune than the 12 tet major third. If we continue this process using justly tuned major thirds as the root of the next chord, we get a progression that sounds like this. By the time we get to the fourth chord, we've now crossed a collective 42 cents worth of terrain, which is fairly close to half of a half step down from where we started. That close. And here's how far we've traveled. But at no point in the progression was there a change that striking. Now, at the beginning of this video, I attributed this cross-terrain modulation to Jacob Collier, but he's not the first person to do this sort of thing. The earliest known documentation of this phenomenon is from 1585 from an Italian mathematician named, uh, that. He created a series of puzzles that all had the same effect. If you use the correct tuning math for each individual interval, as you loop the progression, it slowly rises in pitch. 
Adam Neely has a great video essay on this, which I will link in the description below. My first CTM was an exact copy of the one Adam describes in his video because I didn't quite understand how to make an original one yet. But Benedetti wasn't writing music, he was creating puzzles. That's why I attribute cross-train modulations to Jacob Collier. To my knowledge, he's the first person to use this concept in a piece of music that's meant to be listened to for enjoyment, rather than it being a puzzle to be solved. For listeners with keen ears, his CTMs can be a wonderfully surprising modulation unlike any you've ever heard before. And he's not just doing it to show off, he has perfect pitch, and has emotional connotations for each key. Because of this, going between the keys of 12-tone equal temperament feels like opening up a door to a whole new world for him. So let's look at his arrangement of In the Bleak Midwinter, which also happens to be the first of his works that I ever heard, and analyze his first ever cross-terrain modulation. My process here is going to be look at the loudest frequencies in the RX-8 spectral analysis of the CTM, read the exact frequency of each note, plug those into the JS tone generator, read the number of cents flat or sharp each note is with retune, then put those into my own transcription with the exact tuning of each note. And here we have it. This is my exact frequency transcription of the CTM in Jacob Collier's arrangement of In the Bleak Midwinter. To avoid a copyright strike, I'm not going to play his original recording, but down in the description below, I will have a link to the exact spot in his arrangement where the CTM is heard. I originally had labeled every note with its number of cents, but that got very cluttered very quickly, so now I have labeled only the most important notes for understanding the CTM. I call these labeled notes the guiding notes. So why did he make the tuning choices that he did? This is the chart that I made for making my own CTMs, and it will come in handy for the analysis. On the left we have a list of all the intervals in most 12-tone systems. In the third column, we have the number of cents you have to add to your fixed note in order to get the desired interval in 12 tet. For example, if we want a 12 tone equal tempered major third, we take a fixed note like C and we add 400 cents to it, and now we have an E. In the fourth column, we have just intonation ratios. There are other ratios for these same intervals, but these are the ones that I like the most. In the fifth column, we have the number of cents added to a fixed note if we were to use these just intonation ratios rather than 12 tet. Let's take that major third example again. We have a C, but instead of going up 400 cents, we take the frequency of our fixed note, which is 261.63 in this example, and apply the major third ratio, which is 5 to 4, the 4 representing the C and the 5 representing the E. If you're wondering why it's 5 to 4, we need to go back to the harmonic series. Each successive note in the harmonic series is the number of notes in sequence thus far to 1. This means that our fifth note, which sounds like a major third and two octaves, has a 5 to 1 relationship with the fundamental. We can then move the fundamental up two octaves by multiplying the frequency by 2 twice, and now what used to be a 1 is now a 4, giving us a major third ratio of 5 to 4. The equation here is taking the frequency of our fixed note, multiplying by the first note in our ratio, and dividing by the second. After doing that to our C, tuned to 261.63, we get 327.04, which is the frequency of our justly tuned E in comparison to our fixed pitch C. When we look at our chart of the frequencies of all notes in 12 tet when C is tuned to 61.63, which is where we had it for our examples, we can see that the justly tuned E is very close to the 12 tet E, and this equates to a roughly 14 cents difference, which is why negative 14 is in the second column of my chart. When we justly tune a major third, we're closing the gap between the notes by 14 cents compared to 12 tet. Now we have all the information we need to analyze Jacob's CTM. We begin with this chord which at the start of the chord is tuned to 12 tet, but over the course of the chord, the Bs slide up 18 cents. Why? Because of its relationship to the root of the chord. The B3 is a minor seventh above the C sharp, which in my chart tells us that the interval needs to be 18 cents wider 
in order to be justly tuned. The B4 is an octave above the B3, so it rises in the exact same way. I think Jacob did this because it's as if he said, here's the tuning system you're used to, but I'm going to change things up for the next four chords. That B4 is the only common tone between the first three chords, so once it's tuned to 18 cents sharp, and all the notes in the second chord get tuned to it, it keeps rising up to the third chord. In the third chord, we get more justly tuned intervals. That B4 is now 28 cents sharp from where it was at the beginning of the first chord, so the third chord is tuned 28 cents sharper right along with it, with some justly tuned modifications. That G4 is a major third below the B4, so we can tune it justly by making that interval 14 cents narrower, which puts the G4 at 42 cents sharp. The D4 is a major sixth below the B4, so to justly tune it, we need to close the gap by 16 cents, putting the D4 at 44 cents sharp. The C4 is a major seventh below the B4, so it needs to be 12 cents sharper, which leaves it at 40 cents sharp. The rest of the notes can be tuned to 28 cents sharp like the B4, because their just tunings are almost unnoticeable compared to 12 tet. For example, here's the difference between a 12 tet perfect fifth and a justly tuned perfect fifth. If you can tell the difference, you probably have superpowers. That leads us to the last chord. Many of the notes are the same between these two on sheet music, but only one of them truly gets sustained the D4. It was 44 cents sharp in the third chord, so it's 44 cents sharp in this one as well. That means that as a basis, all the other notes are also tuned to 44 cents sharp, but with a few minor exceptions. The E4 is at 48 cents sharp because the just intonated major second is wider than 12 tet by 4 cents, and the A3 is at 46 cents sharp because a perfect fourth is 2 cents narrower. That B4 has continued to rise through the third chord, landing on 44 cents sharp for this chord so that it is 12 tet in tune with most of the other notes. At this point, he only needs to go up 6 cents for the next chord to land in his famous key of G half sharp major. That difference is barely noticeable when hearing the same chord twice, but he further obscures this tiny change by making the chord change from a 5 to a 1 and by adding a bunch of extra notes to dress it up. So there you go. That's my analysis of Jacob Collier's cross-terrain modulation in his arrangement of In the Bleak Midwinter. But what if you want to make your own? I'll show you. How you go about it depends on where you want to go. When I make them, I typically don't care which key I end up in, which makes figuring out the CTM a little bit easier, but I'll show you that process as well as the process if you know exactly which key you want to end up in. For starters, the I don't care which key I end up in CTM. Presumably you already have a song or a track or something that's already in a key and you simply want to implement a CTM, see where it takes you, and then go on from there. If you don't already have a key, pick one. I'm going to pick C major in standard tuning, meaning that A4 is tuned to 440 hertz. And I'm in 12 tet, so my half steps are all the same distance apart. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to have the first chord in my CTM be a C major chord. But I'm not going to plan out the tuning of every single note just yet, only the guiding notes. So let's keep the C and the E and justly tune the E. Because it's a major third, our E is now 14 cents flat. That E now needs to sustain into the next chord, and we need to choose another interval in relation to it that keeps pushing the tuning down, since that's what the first one did. Instead of doing another interval above, I'm going to do one below, just for fun. We need to widen the space in this interval to keep pushing the tuning down, so our options are minor second, major second, perfect fifth, minor sixth, and a minor seventh. I want the CTM to change the overall tuning as fast as possible, so I'm going to stick with one of the intervals that changes it the most, and for this one, I'm going to go with the minor 7th, which makes our new G flat 18 cents flatter than our E at 14 cents, putting it at 32 cents flat. Now we sustain that into the next chord, and we need to choose a new interval. I want to go back up with this one, so we need to choose an interval that's going to make the gap between the notes a little smaller, 
and bring down our tuning even further. Our options are now minor third, major third, tritone, major sixth, or major seventh. Once again, I want to pick one of the larger ones, so I'm going to go with the major sixth. So our new E flat is now 16 cents flatter than the 32 cents flat G flat, putting the E flat at 48 cents flat. Now, we could just tune the next section 50 cents flat because that difference is pretty much unnoticeable, but just for fun, I'm going to add a fourth chord to our CTM to truly get it to 50 cents flat. I want to go back down again, so our only option for an exactly 2 cent change flatter is the perfect fifth. That gives us an A flat tuned to exactly 50 cents. And just to round it off, we're going to make the first chord in our new section a 50 cents flat D flat major chord, sustaining that A flat minus 50 cents from the previous chord. <sighs> We've now done the hard work of modulating from C major to D flat and a half major, which could more simply be called C half sharp major, which means that we just modulated up 50 cents by incrementally moving down 50 cents. That's kind of neat. Here's what it sounds like when I'm singing it. And don't worry, I'll show you the process of actually applying the tuning math in actual recorded music. I'm just going to do it for the second example because it's kind of redundant to explain the same exact process for both examples. Anyway... Now we just need to fill in those chords with more notes so that they're actually chords and not just intervals. I personally love five-part harmony, so I'm going to add three more notes to each interval. Bang. There it is. Here's what it sounds like with my voice. Now let's implement a CTM when you know for sure both where you're coming from and where you're going. For this one, I'm going to do something similar to the In the Bleak Midwinter CTM. I'm going to start in E major, but instead of ending up in G half sharp major, I'm going to end up in G half flat major. Because I know where I want to end up, I'm going to start from both ends and meet in the middle. For the first chord, I'm going to use an unaltered E from standard tuning E major to make sure that this first chord is not too surprising and add a justly tuned minor 6th above that, giving us a C plus 14 cents. For the final chord of the CTM, I'm going to use a B minus 50 cents from the tonic chord of our new key, and have a justly tuned minor 7th below that to push the tuning down. That will give us a C sharp minus 68 cents, but I'm going to call it a C plus 32 cents to make figuring out how to make the tuning meet in the middle a little easier. For the second chord in our CTM, I'm going to sustain that C plus 14 cents from the first chord and then have a justly tuned major third below that, giving us an A flat plus 28 cents. If we want to stick to this four chord pattern, we have to sustain the A flat plus 28 cents from the second chord and the C plus 32 cents from the fourth chord, giving us a gap of a 12 tet minor sixth minus four cents, which is 18 cents away from a justly tuned minor 6, but because it's only 4 cents away from a 12 tenth minor 6, pretty much nobody will notice. It sounds like this. If that gap does bother you though, there are ways to make it even less noticeable. In this case, we can make what used to be the fourth chord into a quarter note rather than a half note, then add another chord between what used to be our third and fourth chords. If we add a justly tuned minor third below the A flat plus 28 cents, we get an F plus 30 cents, and then when that's sustained over into the new fourth chord, we can justly tune that perfect fourth gap, and we end up with a perfectly justly tuned CTM that sounds like this. If you don't want to add a chord to make it work, but you still don't like that 4 cent gap in the middle, you could just add 1 cent to each interval, which will be unnoticeable for each individual interval, and eliminates the 4 cent gap by simply spreading it out. Here's what that sounds like.
this is the one that I like the most, so I'm going to walk you through the process of actually applying that in actual music. My DAW of choice is Reaper, primarily because it's virtually free, but it is actually a really great DAW, so I have actually bought a legit license for it. If you want to use any other DAW for this process, you're going to have to do some of your own research to figure out how to do some of the steps. Step 1. Make a track and load the ReSynth stock plugin onto it. Step 2. Duplicate that track an equivalent number of times as the number of guiding notes in your CTM. For this example, we have what looks like 8 notes, but since we have 3 notes that sustain from one chord to the next, we really only have 5, so I duplicate the track until I have 5 of them. Step 3. Label the tracks as the note names with the number of cents. I like to label them so that they're in order from top to bottom, so I'll start with the C5 plus 15 cents, then the B4 minus 15 cents, then A flat 4 plus 30, then E4 plus 0, then C4 plus 31. Step 4. Insert MIDI items onto the tracks. Step 5. Double click the MIDI items and place the notes where they belong. Step 6. Tune each track to their respective number of cents. Step 7. Turn your intervals into chords. If you're planning on singing this or playing it on a fretless string instrument and you have a really good ear, you can probably do this without needing to do any more MIDI stuff, but just in case you feel like you don't have a good enough ear or you're planning on playing this on a guitar or something, I'll walk you through adding more MIDI harmonies. I'm actually going to hop back over to my sheet music because that'll make it a bit easier to visualize the voice leading. This is what I came up with for chords, and now we just need to put it into MIDI. Now, because the extra notes in each chord can just be tuned using 12 tet intervals in relation to whatever note was sustained from the last chord, we can just put the extra notes in the right tracks at the right times, and we don't have to make any more tracks. For the first measure and a half, all the notes except for that C5 are in standard tuning and the E4 plus 0 track is in standard tuning, so we can add all the notes into that track. Everything in the second half of the second measure, except for the A flat, can be tuned to C5. So let's stick those notes in the C5 plus 15 track. For the first half of the third measure, we can stick the extra notes in the A flat 4 plus 30 track. For the second half of the third measure, the extra notes can go in the C4 plus 31 track. Finally, the extra notes for the new key can simply go in the B4-50 track. After turning down all the tracks by a few decibels, we can listen back and hear that we've successfully modulated from E major to G half-flat major. That final chord change sounds significantly different from my MuseScore playback because MuseScore doesn't take into account that most of the notes in these two chords that look the same are actually about 80 cents away from each other, but I still like the way it sounds, so I'm keeping it. And here's what that sounds like when I'm singing it. So now, if you're more familiar with another DAW, you can render that audio and put it in whatever project you have in whatever other DAW. Or, if you already use Reaper, or you want to learn how to use Reaper, you're pretty much set. So that was my analysis of Jacob Collier's cross-terrain modulation in his arrangement of In the Bleak Midwinter, as well as an accompanying tutorial on how to make your own CTM. And don't worry if you don't understand everything in this video right away, I definitely felt the same way when I first started learning about this, and I fully anticipate this will be the type of video you have to watch multiple times to truly understand if you don't already have a grasp on most of the topics. That being said, what do you think? Do you think CTMs are going to start being used in more music that isn't Jacob Collier's? I have one in my arrangement of one of his songs. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.